Hello, heathens. Welcome back. I am really excited, as always, but especially today, to have Dr. William Reed here with me. Um, I first met William through Dr. Josh, who everybody knows and loves. They went to Hopkins together. Uh, obviously, Josh was an Assyriologist, and William here got his PhD in Hebrew Bible and Northwestern Semitics. Hello. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Hi. Thanks for having me. Uh, so... I generally like people to introduce themselves. I can talk about folks, but who better to talk about you than you? Um, so would you mind telling us a little bit about your background and what led you to Hopkins? What led you to that area of study? Um, and then kind of how you focused in on your research topic uh, and what that topic is. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I got my uh, undergraduate degree from UNC Chapel Hill huh. um, in, in religious studies, uh, and primarily uh, I was doing um, some Greek and Coptic, uh, so I, I, at the time I was very interested in you know, so-called Gnostic literature um, and kind of how they um, – you know, use the the Hebrew Bible, uh, in, in and kind of interpreted it in different ways. Now, then I applied to uh, you know uh, master's programs, and I got accepted at the University of uh, Seattle in Washington. Um, sorry, University of Washington, Seattle. Uh, and uh, you know, they, I was I was there. Uh, I that program interested me because um, Michael Williams had written, uh, was a scholar of uh, kind of Gnostic Christianity and written a book called Rethinking Gnosticism, which I liked quite a bit. And so I was excited to work with him. But so I, I, I got accepted into the, the um, Near Eastern Studies kind of program. And I, uh, my advisor that summer, you know, reached out to me. He's like, well, we're glad to have you aboard. Um, It'd be great if you if you had some Hebrew, <laughs> and I was like, okay, um, I can do that. So I I found a you know a, a college nearby that that offered a summer Hebrew program, and took it, and then um, kind of just fell in love from there. Uh, and so I ended up kind of switching my my focus from being like Gnostic early Christianity to uh, Hebrew Bible stuff. Um, so I was I got my master's. Uh, at, at UW, and uh, we did, you know, Hebrew. I had taken a little Akkadian, a little Egyptian there, um, and wanted to, to keep it going, so I applied to PhD programs, and, uh, you know, uh, Hopkins was of interest because of Ted Lewis, so he had written a, a book on, on, well, several books on, on Ugaritic and and some of the ritual uh, there and seemed like a, an exciting person to work with and I'll be honest you know I, I talked with some other people he was just more personable on the phone and made me feel more <laughs> welcome so at the end of the day you know uh, that that kind of uh, carried the day so I, I I went to to work with him um, he was my advisor uh, so my as you said my um, you know, uh, discipline was Hebrew Bible, Northwest Semitics. Um, there's uh, four disciplines in, in the department. So there's a Syriology, obviously, um, Egyptology, archaeology, and then, as I said, Hebrew Bible. Uh, and you're required to do kind of a minor in, in one of the others. So I, my minor was in a Syriology. So oh, okay. I, I uh, studied, um, you know, uh, Akkadian and Sumerian with the same same teachers Dr. Josh had. So, um, yeah, so that's how I ended up at Hopkins and, and kind of my, my interest in, in uh, the Hebrew Bible and just kind of uh, learning more about that. Now, as to my, like, uh, dissertation topic, which is, you know, on, on divine weapons, specifically those used in the, the prophets, Jeremiah and Ezekiel, um, you know, there's a version of this that goes back, you know, I'm an 80s kid, so... <laughs> I grew up watching He-Man and Thundercats, and <laughs> so, like, magical weapons that transform the user into, like, super powerful beings, you know. The, on brand. It's very on I brand. Grew up, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, I enjoyed the heck out of it. So, you know, um, and then I, I remember, you know, in my Uber 8 class at, at UW, um, we were reading the, the ball myth, Um which involves so Baal, the storm god, is fighting the the sea god. It's uh, to to 
stay king or become king. Uh, and then he he uh, there's this kind of crafting Smith God kind of a Hephaestus type called Kothar Wahasis. He like makes or provides Baal with these two like enchanted probably maces, but you know, kind of weapons that that uh, have names and, you know, reach out and help him uh, destroy the, the sea god and defeat him. So I, I thought that was was really cool. And then I noticed other things, you know, in, in studying, you know, uh, kind of Akkadian texts in, you know, at, at Hopkins, um, just divine weapons showing up here and there. Uh, and it, it just, you know, and in the case of Mesopotamian and I think Egyptian too, they were at least at certain times and places, these were real ritual objects. They stored them in temples and then brought them out. So um, I was just fascinated by the, the kind of rhetoric around them and then, you know, them as ritual objects. So that kind of spurred uh, me in that direction, getting to the prophets themselves was just kind of in looking at the Hebrew Bible, where do you see divine weapons? Right. You know, you might not even expect to see divine weapons in the Hebrew Bible, but uh, they do show up. It's not, you know, with the same kind of frequency uh, they do in Mesopotamian literature or Egyptian literature, um, but they, they do show up. And so uh, mostly concentrated in Ezekiel and, and Jeremiah. And so that kind of from there was the, the jumping off point, but I'll, I'll stop that. <laughs> no, uh, thank I you. Think answers your question. Yes, absolutely. I actually, this has very little to do with what you just said, but I just received the PDF of Ted Lewis's most recent book, <laughs> uh, solid <laughs> like one thousand pages or something, <laughs> seven hundred pages. Yeah, I no it, the the one. Uh, um, it's about Yah yeah. Yeah, I think I know which one. Notion of Yahweh or something to that effect. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I reviewed drafts of that, you know, <laughs> as he was has working on it at the time. I think if it's the book I I think uh yeah, I um It looks like a dictionary. <laughs> yeah, it would. It, it was. It's. It's a great. It's a great work. I mean, I haven't read it since it's been published, unfortunately. But um, you know, in reading the the pre publication works, chapters and such, it, it was. It was really good. And and Ted is like a phenomenal scholar. And I think more importantly, uh, just a super nice guy, yeah, super so kind, funny. and uh, you know, generous person. Shout out to Ted Lewis. Who's definitely not watching? Oh, this. absolutely. Uh, <laughs> Almost certainly not. No, but that's okay. Um, I want to start off by asking you to define what divine weapons are, um, because I think when I got your conference papers, if you would ask me before I read them, well, what's a divine weapon? I would have been like, I don't know. Uh, so, so I'm assuming <laughs> that my audience, at least most of them, probably don't know either. Sure. Uh, gr uh, good question. I think, I mean, the easiest way is uh, a divine weapon is just a weapon that a god uses. So um, I would say in most cases, they can be kind of iconic to, to that deity. It's not, not always, but some deities have iconic weapons. And to, you know, pull from more popular culture, you could think of like... Uh, Thor's hammer as like uh, you know an iconic weapon associated with a deity, um, you know, and these these things can change from place and time, you know. But um, I know there's a I, it's funny to me uh, there's the the saw of Shamash Shamash the sun god in in Mesopotamian uh, you know mythology has you know a weapon that. I mean, it's the best translation of it. It's a saw, and <laughs> <laughs> which is which is funny. So, uh, but yeah, just any weapon that that a, a god uses or that belongs to uh, a deity. Okay, and you were talking about how it shows up in ancient Mesopotamian literature, and then of course also in um, Assyrian literature later on. Um, and I think what was interesting to me is that you have these weapons that belong to the gods but as you mentioned there's also like a cultic um not image but uh, object that they often keep in their temples or other places of worship that represents that 
weapon, right? I mean, obviously it rep- represents it. It's the, yeah. it looks the same, probably. But um, is the idea that that weapon that's in the temple imbued with some kind of ritual power? Was there some kind of... Um, I'm going to repeat that sentence. Was there some kind of ritual that they did to sort of imbue partial power from the god's weapon to this physical weapon? Ah, uh, so I don't know of any. So I, I would ass- – so, I, you know, shaky ground here. Uh, to my knowledge, um, in, in looking through the sources, I have, have never come across like, a, like an imbuing ritual. Right. Now, we know of rituals for – like, you know, the the statues of the gods that would be sure. in the temples to like, you know, for the, the god to inhabit them. So would it surprise me that they had something similar for the weapons themselves? Probably not. Okay. We we don't happen to have any that survive if if that was. And I I would just say a couple of things. Um one, uh just to kind of like make a a, a differentiation or just to, to clarify. So a weapon might end up in the temple for a variety of reasons. Okay. Um, I mean, you can think about um, the sword of Goliath ends up in a temple in 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 the Hebrew Bible. Um, why that ended up in a, in a Yahwistic, presumably temple is is hard to say. But um, so uh, we do have some like votive offerings. So sometimes like a you know and. T- to do something like a weapon, you're probably pretty well off. Uh, but you would, like, gift it to the deity so it sits in the temple. Um, I, those are distinct uh, from, you know, I think the, the divine weapons that would – that have kind of a ritual function. Um, so we have some texts that describe the rituals that – that they would be involved in, not their like commissioning or, or that sort of thing. Uh, but uh, I'll give you a couple examples. Um, one is, um, again, we'll go back to Shamash, uh, the sun god, who's also the, the god because the sun like sees everything and like sheds light on everything. He's also like a god of justice mm-hmm. and, and uh, involved in, you know, like judgments, like courts, that sort of thing. So sometimes if, Say two people had a dispute over like the borders of their land, like two farmers, and this one says, "Actually, that's your. This is my my land. This like my land includes this tree." And this other guy might come and say, "No, actually, that tree's on my land." And and then if there's no like document for which that you know they they could point to to settle this, um, they would bring the the weapon of Shamash from a temple to like and and how it adjudicates between them uh, the the ritual is not clear but it, it, it somehow does. it it like um Funny. you know points to to the to the clear you know the person in the right here Interesting. in some way so the weapons i guess my sorry i'm probably not being incredibly clear here did the peop did the assyrians did they believe that this weapon in their temple had any special power or was it just sort of a representation of the weapon of the gods that they thought had special power up there or wherever they thought the god was does that make sense yeah i think so exactly what they thought of it again we we don't have a lot of detail i'm asking i would say (laughs) okay yeah no that's fair it's these are good questions i it's just you know we we have the data we have right and and sometimes we we don't have that kind of interiority right. on on kind of like what they thought about these things but let me let, i'll give some examples that might be illustrative um so in addition to the you know kind of a weapon being kind of rented out for kind of um uh, you know, to to find who's guilty or, or not in a certain in certain judicial cases, um, the most popular and of course it's it's a royal ritual is like the coronation of the king. Right. They they will receive you know objects from the gods. Now some of these objects are you know, um, I mean they're not literal. So like you might receive the the terrifying splendor of. Nergal or something, <laughs> right? That's like a radiance that just like you know comes off you, that intimidates your enemies. Um, I, I don't that believe goes. that was a. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I knew how that. <laughs> um, but uh, and and I don't think 
that that was probably a, a, an actual object. But they also receive like a crown. Right. You might receive like the crown of Enlil. You might receive like a scepter of another god, uh, a weapon of Ninurta, right? Um, a warrior god. And there's uh, reason to think that those were probably actually ritual objects. Okay. Uh, that, that at least symbolically, like in the coronation, bestow some like authority and power. I think there's also some, some examples, although this is mainly literary. I mean, all this is really literary, but um, literary depictions that, that a king might like receive a weapon before a battle. Okay. Um, as part of like to empower them to go out. Now, I th I believe most of these ritual objects, to the extent that we know about them, were probably, you know, they're probably made of like precious metals and stuff right. and that sort of thing. In, in the sense of they wouldn't be really a great functional weapon, <laughs> right? Like gold is soft, right. that sort of thing. So I I don't think if if you had like a golden sword, say that the the Assyrian king is is charging into battle <laughs> with that, <laughs> but they might receive it the day before as kind of like an empowering thing uh, before the battle. Um, so. I think, you know, they were objects, I think, obviously, just like with the gods and with, like, physical representations of the gods, the god is both, like, in the temple where his, his like, statue is, is located, but also, you know, in the heavens or whatever is right. beyond that in some way. I, I would imagine that the weapon functions similarly. And to complicate things further, uh, some some weapons are gods like they they and and i don't know like if you want to think about it in kind of like uh, an advancing or an evolution of a, a conception like you know they start out as a weapon and then they get popular and then they become their right. own gods i you know i couldn't i couldn't say if it's if there's that kind of trajectory to it but um Ninurta has two weapons that are that are gods themselves that like talk to him and you know that sort of thing and they can fly um so Naturally. you know this not everyone's weapon became like uh, its own independent god but some did uh, so i think you know that that kind of boundary was maybe more fluid yeah, no that, that makes, makes sense. sense can you talk a little bit about um imperial rhetoric um it's something that i sure. see you discuss in the conference papers and i think it becomes particularly interesting because when we start talking about Isaiah and Ezekiel, um, actually, I'm, at least Isaiah, you'll have to correct me if I'm wrong on Ezekiel, but Isaiah sort of subverts this rhetoric to create um, resistance while he's sort of in exile or um, in <laughs> captivity. And I thought that was really interesting because when I was reading through the Bible nine million times when I was an evangelical Christian, um, I had no clue, zero clue whatsoever about anything going on because you read the vacuum in a bubble, right? You read the vacuum in a bubble. You read the Bible in a read bubble. bubble. <laughs> um, and so viewing Isaiah's writings, as someone so eloquently put it on Twitter, as slam poetry was, <laughs> was a whole like new thing for me. And I just thought it was incredibly fascinating. Um, but I am assuming that if I didn't know what imperial rhetoric was, there's probably somebody else out there that doesn't either. Uh, and so I'd love for you to explain that a little further. So, yeah, imperial rhetoric or, or you know, is kind of a, a flavor of royal rhetoric, which is, I mean, mostly it's it's used to legitimize like a king and, and you know, in, in this case, because we're talking about an empire, they're kind of imperial expansionistic, uh, you know, claims or efforts, right? right? This is to defend them. Uh, to So it's propaganda. It's it's propaganda for the, the king and the empire. Right. That's, that's and the, um, Sean Zelgaster, uh, who has written about uh, this very thing, um, you know, uh, Assyrian royal rhetoric in Isaiah, um, you know, kind of identifies two main audiences with the, the, the Assyrian version of this. Obviously, this kind of thing goes back, you know, to, to kind of the very earliest royal inscriptions. Anything that's like, you know, on behalf of or in the name of a king is probably seeking to like legitimize okay. the king in some way or or kind of like establish their 
you know, their qualifications. Uh, you'll, you usually find more of it. Like if someone has usurped the throne, then right. there'll usually be a lot more of it there because they've got more to prove. Um, but, uh, you know, it, 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 it definitely goes back and it's, you know, self-aggrandizing <laughs> propaganda, that sort of thing. Um, so in the Assyrian period, you know, we're especially in and around the time of Isaiah, um, Assyria is just beginning this new kind of expansionistic push, which is, you know, connected uh, to Tiglath-Pileser III uh, taking the, the throne in like 740s uh, BCE. So he comes, he comes to power and he has a more, not that Assyria hasn't had expansionistic periods before, but this is like a big push out of what had been kind of more Mesopotamian related areas. So now they're actually kind of, crossing the river, they're going into Syria, um, Palestine, that sort of thing. And, and so they have, you know, a more expansionistic outlook and that is kind of coupled with these royal inscriptions that, that they're, they're doing. And of course that's not new either. Um, but they, you know, the, the aim of these is really to kind of assert the supremacy of the Syrian king you know, their invulnerability, invincibility, their their power, you know, it's to cow other people into behaving, basically. <laughs> what? Um, and, That's and, crazy. And <laughs> show how great the Assyrian king is, right? And the audience, again, to get back to, to uh, Sean Del Del Astor's point, is, you know, he saw, and this, I think it's a pretty common perception as two main audiences for this kind of rhetoric one is like assyrian elites so these are like you know inner circle core people is you know you want everyone to think that the gods are on your side yeah. and that you're invincible and you can do no wrong because you don't want to get like usurped or assassinated you know it sounds so, so you're familiar trying to keep... i mean i don't know like, <laughs> it just sounds painfully painfully familiar but yeah <laughs> So you, you want to pe keep the people in power close at home, right in line, but it's also, it, it also looks outward. So it looks outward to the, the kind of people that you're going to be invading or showing up at their doorstep asking for tribute, right? You want them to know that you are unstoppable, that they don't have a chance in the world, that all the gods are behind you, right? And this is also, it dovetails, I think, you know, the Assyrians also have the reputation of being, like, excessively brutal, right? right? Um, if, if you've seen, uh, coupled with these, uh, some of these royal inscriptions, you, you may be aware that they adorn their palaces with these, like, carved reliefs of... Uh, well, a lot of different things, but, you know, battles, right. you know, and, and, you know, have, you know, some wonderful details like people's heads on spikes mm. or people being flayed Love in it. front of a city. Who <laughs> um, doesn't want to look at that you know, every day, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, it, so again, that's clearly meant it, these things dovetail and in, you know, for some of these reliefs, they have like a text that, that goes across the bottom that's, you know, it's not like descriptive, like a caption, but it, it's, you know, that's more royal rhetoric, imperial rhetoric. Uh, so the, the imagery and then the text tend to go together in trying to convey the same thing, which is we're unstoppable. You don't want to mess with us. So if we show up on your door, Give us our you money. know, yeah, basically it's a shakedown. Bitch better uh, have my money. You know what I mean? Except for the Assyrian <laughs> version. So it, Within this rhetoric, can you give us maybe an example of something that would be the sort of master narrative and then how Isaiah or Ezekiel or Jeremiah or whoever you'd like to speak to, how they would have taken that and sort of flipped it on its head? Yeah. So, I, I mean, I'll, I'll as as is my, my specialty, I'll maybe focus on the, the, the weapon related stuff. Right. Um, uh, so again, as as we talked about in these narratives, sometimes it, it starts out with you know I think in a few cases, Esther Haddon, if I'm not mistaken, uh, we have like a, a a description of kind of like you know their first year and what happened, and you know it's that same thing. Enlil gave me his crown, and Ninurta gave me his weapon, and you know. Uh, Etc. 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 So they receive these objects, these weapons, and then usually, um, th then they, in, in 
in addition to saying, you know, here, now we've equipped you to be king, it's also like go out and conquer right. is kind of this message. And they're doing it uh, on behalf of the gods. Um, and so they also, you know, as I said, sometimes before a battle, especially a particularly intense battle, um, they might pray. I think there's one where uh, the Assyrian king is maybe surrounded by his enemies and he's like worried. So he prays to the gods and, you know, as, in answer to his prayer, right, as part of this, he gets like Ishtar gives him uh, her bow to use, uh, bow and arrows to, to use. Um, and sometimes they receive, um, you know, what amounts to like mythological weapons. So, uh, you know, uh, Marduk from the Enuma Elish, you know, that's the Babylonian kind of creation right. myth. Uh, he receives a weapon from, from the gods to, to go fight Tiamat. And, you know, there's some implication in, in, you know, when, um, when the, the Syrian Kings is, is praying and receives, he, he receives like the weapon that cuts off life, which other scholars have taken to be a reference to the Enuma Elish, <laughs> which suggests that he might've received like this, you know, mythological weapon. So not just the weapon of the God, but like, uh, a, a, a weapon from myth. And that, that plays out in, in, in other examples too. Um, so they get these these magical weapons that are supposed to help them be unstoppable, and then they go out into battle, and then the gods are you know on their side, empowering them, right? But I I would say the just to emphasize the king because this is royal rhetoric meant to flatter the king, right? He so. is like the one that goes out and does the he's got the weapon, he's swinging it around, yeah. people are dying left and right, you know, he's the active participant. Sometimes he's running ahead of the army and they're having to catch. Up yeah. because he's such a badass, you know, that sort of thing. So that's the kind of rhetoric that, that's floating around. And I would say coupled with that is usually this like – so it's not just that the, the king is, is, is great and invincible. He's pious. The gods love him. He always does what the gods want, <laughs> right? So there's this – and then his enemies are always – The worst. These people that trust in themselves. They've, they trusted in themselves instead of the gods. Oh. That's kind of the rhetoric. That sounds uh, familiar. And so he's there to, to show them up. And as, as another example, sometimes even other people's gods are unhappy with their people and they like – they're on the side of the Assyrian king too. Right. That that can happen, uh, where they're basically asking him to come in and conquer and restore the right worship of uh, you know their correct worship. So that's some of the things that would be in the backdrop. Now, what does Isaiah do with some of this? Um, in in Isaiah seven, he takes this idea right. So Yahweh is 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 going to to punish his people. Um, there in some way and he's he says he's going to take a razor which is the hired uh, the hired hand of assyria and shave his people including like a veiled reference to pubic hair it's the the hair okay, of the, I have the to, legs I but have that's to stop you there because when i read that in the paper i was like oh, okay i don't see the connection but that's hilarious uh and so i was wondering if you might be able just to briefly explain that because i i clearly missed something oh from the from the isaiah passage yeah like uh, the pubic seven. hair hair leg and sort of yeah it's a known euphemism ah, okay. right uh, the bible tends not to for some, some things it, just like you know uh, you know they lie with instead right of, I mean, right right it's you, so there's um or if water like drips down your legs that's like you piss yourself um <laughs> So there, there are some e euphemisms. So this one's commonly understood to be like the hair of the legs is is not actually leg hair. It, it's it's a reference Got to, it. to pubic and hair. And so it's meant to be like uh, a also denigration. Also shaving their right? beards, which is it's it's humiliation, right? Because they're shaving their head is something you do when you're in mourning. Shaving your beard is you know a huge like if you're you might do it in mourning, but you you wouldn't do it like you know uh, if someone does that to you, it's a huge shame. Um, so this is meant to be a shaming activity. Got it. Okay. Um, and so he he's doing this with the you know the razor that is the king of Assyria. So on the one hand, all right, he's 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 using that rhetoric. The the king is a weapon in some way, it, to the extent that you might think of a, a razor as as 
a weapon. I mean, I wouldn't think of like a big thing. This is probably just a sharp, <laughs> short knife. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but he's, u- so a couple things. One, Yahweh's the one using it. Right. You don't normally see that in the, like, you know, the king can be a weapon. Right. That, that happens. But it um, seems like uh, when the Assyrians, or I think probably many other people are talking about it, it's more of an active role. So the king is doing yeah. all of these things as opposed to but he's a weapon, but he is the one controlling the weapon as well. It's just the weapon is himself. Whereas it sounds like Yahweh would have been sort of having Assyria in his hand, so to speak. Um, and the Assyrian king doesn't really have a choice but to do this because Yahweh is directing him, guiding him, whatever you want to call it. So it's a much more passive role, which again is kind of humiliating, I would think, for a king who is aggressive and macho and independent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, exactly. It is. So there's, there's, this is not an elite weapon. It's a razor. So it's a downgrade. Yeah. Um, it's being wielded by Yahweh. So you're absolutely right. When kings become weapons, and that's, again, another kind of like, maybe that feels on the face of it, a downgrade in some way, but they're, they're really just aping or kind of mimicking Ninurta, this kind of warrior God that this was emblematic and, and kind of, you know, the ideal for kingship, kingship, especially in, in Mesopotamia. Um, but, you know, especially amongst the Assyrians and, you know, Ninurta was called the net of the gods. He was, you know, he has, so various gods also kind of go by the weapons that they use that becomes like names or, or uh, epithets or titles that, that they have. And the, the Assyrian king is, is no different. So he, he takes on epithets too of some of these, these divine weapons. So that in and of itself, it would be fine. But as you said, uh, exactly they they launch into action independently, right? They, you know, as the, the divine weapon of the gods, they might, as a net, ensnare someone or as a, you know, a, a mace strike someone, but they're not, you know, they're not being used in the hand of another god. They're, they're uh, active and, and doing this all on their own for, you know, again, this is valor and, and praise for them. So being wielded by Yahweh is probably Some a downgrade. Some kind of and inconsequential. <laughs> Yes, right. Yeah, it, it it takes their agency out, so they're they're kind of uh, you know I mean, figuratively a tool of of, <laughs> of uh, another god, and then yeah, being used to shave, uh, especially a pubic region, would be another insult on on top of everything else. Um, so so that shows up in in Isaiah seven. In Isaiah ten, you have another. So there. Assyria is the rod of of Yahweh's anger and wrath. Um, again, a, a rod and a staff are not necessarily so. I, they're not like elite mythic weapons in the same way that a lot of the Assyrian uh, kind of references are. They do receive rods and staff. They're they're connected with you know uh, kingship and ruling, so they do receive these from the gods. But they they um, they don't. You know, uh, there is a slight downgrade in that uh, they don't usually take, you know, they're not, uh, they don't become the staff or the, right. the rod themselves. The, those, that's usually reserved for more elite uh, mythic weapons. Um, but the other thing is in, in that, in that very chapter. So, yeah, he's, uh, the, again, the, the, the staff that's, presumably being wielded by Yahweh, thus, again, in the hand of someone else. But he also gets chastised for overreaching, going too far, not knowing his place, um, you know, in, in, in those verses. And that is definitely, and, and, and Peter Machinist, who's an Assyriologist, has written about this uh, as, as an intentional inversion, right? Because this is the flip. Normally, it's the Assyrian king's enemies who are like, uh, you know, trusting in themselves, not not knowing their place, not understanding, you know, what the gods want. And there's the Assyrian king, you know, the complete fulfillment of divine will, doing everything right. The <laughs> gods are so pleased with him. Yay. And this is the flip, because now the Assyrian king is the arrogant one, acting on his own, not knowing his place, that sort of thing. So it's it's a flip. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, would you speak a little bit about 
the divine weaponry in Ezekiel, sort of what's going on there, um, what those weapons are, and what he's trying to do with them. Yeah, for sure. So, um, you know, Ezekiel's writing after the first, you know, or the date of that particular. So we're we're talking about, uh, I'm mainly talking about Ezekiel chapter 30 here. Um, so this is, um, you know, after obviously the Nebuchadnezzar comes, besieges Jerusalem, um, but uh, just deports like the elites. This is that mm -hmm. first wave, uh, deportation wave. And then, you know, uh, so this chapter, because it has a kind of a date formula, you can you can date it pre precisely to April 587 BCE. Uh, it, it's it's a it's a rarity uh, that you get that level of specificity. Um, and what's happening here is right. The, the captives have been uh, deported for almost about 10 years at, at this point. And um, Nebuchadnezzar, because the, you know, the, the Judean king has stopped paying tribute has, has come back around. This will, will be the final siege and the destruction of Jerusalem. And so uh, the siege is going on. I think it's estimated to, I, so at this point, I think it's usually understood that the, the Egyptians have tried to break the siege. Um, and ultimately, obviously they're unsuccessful because <laughs> Jerusalem falls. Um, Sorry, but, did you say that the um, Egyptians tried to break the siege? Yes, that's correct. It does seem odd, doesn't it? Um, and so that's why they're – so this whole chapter is kind of about that and kind of chastising the, the king of Egypt. And, you know, uh, it, it involves breaking his arms and that sort oh, of thing. But just to rewind. So uh, why would, would Egypt – intervene on the on the behalf uh, uh, of Judah here. Uh, you know, we don't know for sure, but, you know, kind of putting it into context, right? Uh, during, so the, the Assyrian Empire had, had fallen um, around 609, and that's, you know, then the, the Neo-Babylonian Empire is on the rise. So for, for most of its history, you know, Assyria and Egypt are, are antagonists. They don't like each other. Assyria invades Egypt a couple of times. They're both kind of squabbling over, like, they both kind of consider the Levant their, their territory. Now, of course, Egypt has, you know, had a presence in the Levant uh going back to the old kingdom, maybe right. even older. Uh, but, you know, it ebbs and flows in various times depending on their strength. So they didn't like Assyria very much. Uh, they were always kind of uh, competing. And, you know, obviously Assyria tried to invade a few times. But as Assyria is getting weak and, and Babylonia is getting strong, the I, they come – to actually intervene on the behalf of the Assyrians. Now, why would they do that? Uh, probably because they, they, they thought if we can, a weak Assyria is better for us than a strong Babylon. Right. And the and enemy so, you know is always uh, better than the enemy you don't, right? <laughs> sure. And, and, you know, it, I think they probably saw maybe we can cut some sort of deal. We can get more territorial like concessions right. or agreements uh, if if we work with Assyria, which is weak and needs us versus Babylon. So right. that's kind of the same thing that's going on here. Uh, the the reason why Zedekiah like flip flops between you know stops paying tribute. Uh, one, uh, Nebuchadnezzar tries to invade Egypt and is un unsuccessful, and so he has to like you know run home with his tail between his legs. Right. And then then Egypt, you know, has kind of a victory march that they do through the, the Levant, uh, you know, after this. And then, of course, it's not a good idea to be, you know, a loyal Babylonian vassal when the Egyptian king is at your door. Right. So he switches allegiances. But then they leave and Babylon comes back. So, again, it's the same thing, just trying to undermine um, – Babylonian control of the region right. would be why they okay. they would probably try and intervene in, <laughs> in this in this situation. And Ezekiel's message throughout, you know, the book. And I, a small caveat: I would just say I should have said this at the beginning when I talk about Isaiah and I talk about Ezekiel. I use na the the names, you know, uh, but you know it. 
you can't be sure it was just one person. It could right. be a school. It could be several people. It could be edited over time. You know, all yeah. these things are likely. But just for simplicity's sake, I'll just right. refer to, you know, the author of the the text that we call Ezekiel as Ezekiel. That's so out of curiosity, anyway, uh, I know that we've or I've had people discuss before sort of is Isaiah two books or three books and how did it come together? I've heard less about sort of the construction of Ezekiel. Um, do you have any kind of background or information on how that book would have been constructed or if there, if it's thought that many people contributed or if they really do think it's one sort of univocal voice? So I think, you know, I'm not sure that there's a hundred percent agreement right, on course. this. I, I know that a lot of the the later chapters, especially describing the new temple and, and that is thought to be kind of a later edition. I don't have a strong feeling one way or the other. It, it wouldn't surprise me if this was, you know, maybe one or two people putting together a number of kind of prophecies over some years. Yeah. Uh, but it could be one person. I mean, you just, I, I don't have a, a strong, it's not like Pentateuchal criticism right, right, or, right. or uh, you know, uh, the Isaiah thing where there are like clearly different time periods involved yeah. in which it would be like impossible for one person to, to write, you know, across all those of different course. time periods going from Assyria to like Persian and, and that sort of thing. Um, so there's nothing quite as like striking, but obviously people find divisions in different areas and, 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 and think this might've been written by a later author or inserted, but I, I don't know, aside from the, the later temple stuff, I'm not sure that there's like a clear, um, you know, like uh, it's easy to explain, like tripartite, like with with Isaiah okay. that sort of thing. Okay. But you know, I claim that's not not an area that you know I uh, I put a lot of time and effort yes, into. I it, promise, so we I will not hold you to it. Uh. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> um, so, but it, it's a great question. I I just don't have the answer definitively. So, um, I'm I'm in, as interested in anyone. In, in <laughs> it doesn't sound if, like anyone it, has the definitive answer. So. <laughs> No worries well, there. It is it is rare, uh, but yeah, I, I'm not sure that there's a consensus view. I I feel like a lot of people treat it as a unified work for you know simplicity's sake, maybe because there's basically no real smoking gun saying it's not right. Um, and and I'm happy to do that. Um, so yeah, uh, Ezekiel's message has generally been throughout. I mean, you. I think if you were an exile in Babylonia, you might consider his his message pretty dour and <laughs> and and gloomy, which is you know basically Yahweh, you know, he's punishing us. This is going to you know this is going to happen, and Jerusalem is going to fall, and That's you just got to suck it up and deal with it. Uh, yeah, <laughs> Thanks, so. Guys. Uh, Right. So it's important for, for Ezekiel to kind of write about this, it, it, uh, you know, the Egyptian siege, because obviously people are going to have hope. There were, you know, not ever, not all the prophets are on the same page message wise. I mean, Jeremiah and Ezekiel are, but both, but they also describe other prophets, uh, especially amongst Jeremiah, you know, that are preaching basically like, oh, you know, God's going to show up and he's going to rout the Assyrians or he's going to rout the Babylonians or, you know, that right. sort of thing. This kind of positive, we're going to, we're going to make it. God's going to show up. And, you know, Jeremiah and Ezekiel are both like, no, that's, that's not how it's <laughs> going to uh, So, so th this is a, a moment where, you know, if, if, you know, the, the exiles hear about it, you know, they're hearing about it like, oh, did you hear the, the Egyptians showed up? Maybe they're going to break the siege. Maybe, you know, right. they'll chase Nebuchadnezzar away. You know, th they have some hope. Yeah. So then Ezekiel kind of weighs in and, and has this prophecy. And basically God shows up and is like, no. And because you stepped into, you know, I'm punishing my people. The Egyptian king has stepped into this. You've tried to intervene, and now you're going to get punished for it too. Naughty. So God breaks the the Pharaoh's arms, and then the weapon drops from his hand. He has a weapon; it drops from his hand, and uh, then God gives his sword, so Cherev, the word for sword, to the Babylonian king, uh, and commands him to to stretch it out, and you know, then then God defeats. Right. The, Thanks a lot, Egypt. The, the Egyptians. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, 
Yeah, my uh, the the kind of counter narrative here is again, uh, and that that same kind of motif. It's it's less frequent, I think, um, in in neo Babylonian literature. This these weapon motifs they're not gone. They're just less frequent. Um, Babylonian royal inscriptions are a little less bellicose than than the Assyrian ones. I, they they still have their moments, but there's a lot less of it. They're more about temple building. Okay. I mean, on like a you know per volume sort of thing. But they do describe you know uh, Nabopolassar right uh, strikes at the the Assyrians with the the weapon of uh, of Era. The, the plague god. So, you know, it's still there. Um, and, you know, uh, of note um, in there's uh, uh, the so-called uh, Nabu uh, acrostic hymn, uh, Nabu being like the scribal god, but also the son of Marduk, who's, uh, you know, uh, Nebuchadnezzar's name, that Nebu is Nabu, the god. Right, okay. So this is... Um, his, yeah, his name is Nabu Kaduru Utsar. But um, so Nabu, so he has this acrostic. And at, at the end, like we've seen before with some of the Assyrian kings, he receives, you know, some as part of, you know, becoming king. Uh, of his compensation he package. Receives some, <laughs> yeah, the, the usual package, which includes <laughs> like uh, divine weapons and the and specifically he re receives like. Uh, the mace uh, without equal or something that that he can use to to strike his enemies. Anyways, just to say to set up that this motif carries on through the the Neo Babylonian period, presumably, you know, either um, in in kind of the rhetoric that they might have received during, you know, probably getting some some amount of propaganda in in that first siege. That long walk from Jerusalem God. to to Babylon, you know, there's a lot of time to, <laughs> to hear about how great the Babylonian king is. They're like, yeah, and I then, can tell. You know, he's been in Babylon for about <laughs> ten years, and so probably has <laughs> <laughs> probably heard no end of it. So here again, the Yahweh is bestowing his weapon. I think uh, some scholars have kind of read that as, oh, but it's an inversion because it's Yahweh giving the weapon and not Marduk or Nabu or any of the era, any of the Mesopotamian gods. I feel like that's less, at least, you know, I think generally the kings would be happy to receive a, a weapon from any god, <laughs> right? I think because it's flattering. Um and so I, I see that less as, uh, of the issue and, and more that, you know, he receives it, but he doesn't get to do anything with it, right? Like, again, Yahweh's the one who acts. Boring. Yahweh's <laughs> is the one who breaks the the Egyptian king's arms. He's the one that, that you know, Yahweh takes never care lets of the Egyptians. anyone have any fun, you know? He's just going <laughs> to give me a weapon and not let me use it. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, he does give Moses a staff, and Moses gets to use it. So, yeah. but but in this case, no. And and yeah, so there's there's kind of a demotion of status here. Again, the yes, the Nebuchadnezzar is given the weapon, but he he doesn't get to play hero with it, right? right? He he just gets to to stand there. <laughs> And I think, you know, Just uh, stand there and look pretty, it, it, Nebuchadnezzar, OK, please. <laughs> <laughs> Basically. And and so this becomes kind of a I think it's a way to play off some of that. If if you can imagine some of the, the captives, uh, Judean captives have been hearing this rhetoric and and basically Ezekiel's taking it going. Yes, but right. Like it's true that that and this is throughout that the Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king, is like the instrument of of Yahweh's wrath. Right. But but that's all he is, right? That the he's just a, an instrument in this case. He's not like divinely chosen, favored in a way that's he was just like, the person that you know, was there, making like a messiah or something. Right. You know, not like Cy the the kind of reception Cyrus receives in 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 some texts. Um, I he he is the instrument, but he's he's you know that that doesn't make him heroic in, in right. Ezekiel's mind. So I have a quick question. It's slightly it's mm -hmm. slightly off topic, but you were saying that the Neo Babylonians were much less about this sort of divine weaponry and imagery, and much more about sort of volume temple building. And I'm wondering if you have any idea 
maybe not why they weren't, they didn't care about divine weapons, but why they were so interested in building a billion temples. <laughs> sure. Uh, and, and just the caveat that, that the Assyrians mentioned building temples, but you're, you're talking about like in a volume, if you're looking at like royal inscriptions, a lot of it's about battles. Right. Um, whereas the, a lot of what uh, we see in Neo-Babylonian inscriptions are about temple building, that sort of thing. So uh, one, we have a lot less uh, Neo-Babylonian royal inscriptions okay. compared to Neo-Assyrian that, you know, just something to consider that maybe right. in, in a long stretch it would have evened out. But I think maybe the the best answer to that question is, you know, the Babylonians never enjoyed being under Assyrian control, and they spent several, like 100-plus years rebelling and fighting, and that fighting happened in their backyard. So a yeah. lot of areas, uh, it, you know, Babylon had been destroyed and run down. Yeah. Um, so they were looking to like build those back up, and they actually settled like the you know they have a different deportation policy compared to the Assyrians. The Assyrians would take you, so you know it was akin to a three strikes in your out policy. <laughs> they they show up, you don't pay. You know they might sack your city or or put. <laughs> usually they they kill or or take captive the, whoever was in charge, right. and put someone else. From your people on the throne who's, you know, pro-Assyrian. Right. Um, and if that person rebels, then then they usually will uh, put uh, – come in and uh, maybe put someone, you know, like an Assyrian on, <laughs> on the throne basically to control the area. And, and it eventually will become kind of a province of, of Assyria if if you, you keep kind of rebelling and, and going wrong. Uh but their deportation policy was more – they would take someone from here and they would move them over here. You know, they were into mixing people up so that you weren't – you know, it, it wasn't your land anymore, right? right? This isn't your homeland. Are you going to rise up and fight for a, an area that you've been uh, yeah. forcibly relocated to and you're surrounded by a bunch of people? You know, it's like you, but then there will be some – you know, if you're, say, you know, a northern Israelite, you get you might be next to – you know, some Hittites and some, you know, or Neo-Hittites, as the case may be, or some Elamites. You're going to be surrounded with people who don't speak your language. It's going to be hard to, like, form a coalition and and fight the Assyrians. So they were kind of, you know, kind of mixing populations right. about. Smart. Yeah. Smart. <laughs> uh, the, the Babylonians didn't. They would move mainly populations in in, in – in, center them in large groups, but, but they had a job for them, which is, you know, they wanted them to kind of revitalize all of these areas that had been kind of, uh, you know, uh, damaged in all the wars with the Assyrians, right. you know, uh, to, to bring back farming and life to the, these kind of communities. Were so, they incentivized you know, that's why... with anything other than like, you otherwise will kill you? Um, or like, you know what I mean? Like, were, were they incentivized? Oh, you mean... Well, amongst the the Babylonians, I think yes. Uh, I mean, a couple of generations in, you know, you could be successful. We have, you know, like some some inscriptions from what was, you know, it was basically called Judah Town. That was the <laughs> the, the the name of the city in you know in Babylonia, Very original, where a lot of the Judeans were settled, um, and so. Uh, we we do have some some you know transaction documents like they they would be marrying their daughters to people they might be buying things here and there which showed that they were able to accumulate at least in some cases a certain amount of wealth right right um, and as you know by the end of the the period and into like the Persian period these people you know continue to you know s certain families I'll say continued to to be successful and and you know they obviously not everyone when when it came when they were allowed to go back to uh judah chose to do so right. they they you know a certain amount stayed so yeah i think there's a certain amount of incentive right i mean one you want to feed yourself i'm sure there's you're kind of contingent on that <laughs> you're, you're obviously paying a tax to to you know the temples and and the the ultimately the king but i think you know i imagine 
surplus, you know, over those things, if you have it, was probably yours to, to do with what you, you wanted. And so some people were able to accumulate yeah. wealth. I would assume I mean, if you had been for sort of forcibly relocated in a group, even once you find some measure of success and stability, you're probably pretty okay with just keeping it that way, especially if for generations, it's just been sort of violence and instability and not very much economic success. <laughs> so that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's right. Some people definitely, you know, and there's a lot of literature on like acculturation and assimil assimilation. So, you know, it runs the gamut. Like I think we find some examples where they have like uh, in some of these cuneiform documents, they might have, I mean, it's hard to recognize someone who's, who's Judean if they don't have kind of a Yahwistic type. Right. Name. Some people, uh, you know, would like take more local names. So with, you know, Mesopotamian gods, but then you also have people that are, are going to hold to their tradition of regardless. Course. Right. So that, that continued through. So yeah, there'll be all kinds, you know, a whole gamut of responses. Some people, you know, are going to be, uh, just waiting for the day that they can go back and they're never happy there. And then there'll be others who make the best of it. And, you know, right. might even after a generation or two consider themselves like Babylonians in some sense. So. All right. Well, on that note, I want to be respectful of everybody's <laughs> time. Um, thank you so much for being here and for discussing this with me. I, again, am so grateful for, and I know you don't consider yourself an active scholar at the moment, but like for scholars and people that are, are so educated um, sharing their work with me because, and with my audience, because I know for me, sort of part of my anti-indoctrination experience, right, when I was getting out of the church, um, was getting access to scholarship that wasn't necessarily counter-apologetic. It wasn't meant to be something that someone leaving the church would read because it would, you know, suddenly free their mind. Um, it was just honest scholarship about things in the Hebrew Bible. And when I was able to, to read that and it's like, no one had an agenda, right? It was just like, I did research on this topic and like, here's some really interesting stuff. I don't care about you if you're a Christian, like, no, I don't care about you, but like, it's not for Christians. It's not for like anti-theists. It's just scholarship on this topic. And being able to read that and learn so many things about the Bible that I had never been taught when I was a Christian was actually was really part of my was part of freeing my brain from all the shackles of indoctrination because you <laughs> see like all of these things that I was taught or not taught um like there's so much more than just this like one very sort of plain linear univocal message across 66 books of the Bible, right? Um, so it, I think it's really cool and exciting and I know other people are going to learn so much. So thank you again for being here. I would love to have you back sometime. So it's usually at this point that I ask folks to tell us where we can find them. Um, but I also say, if you don't really want to be found, uh, that's fine. <laughs> and on that, <laughs> if, if you're like, yeah, I'm, I'm not really into that. Um, then maybe you can recommend a book to folks and it can be on any topic sure. you find interesting. Um, and then you can never be found. No. <laughs> well, yeah, there's, there's not really any place where, where I can be found, you know, definitely. And so I, I prefer That's fine, not to be right? found as you said, <laughs> but as, as a recommendation, I mean, I do like Sean Zellig Astor's uh, reflections of empire in, in Isaiah. Um, so for more on this topic, you know, uh, he doesn't deal with the weapon stuff. That's my, that's my thing. But, um, you know, just, he talks about like, you know, he, it would be a good introduction for anybody. It, he talks about the basics of imperial royal ideology and rhetoric, how it might have been transmitted, you know, to to Judah from Assyria, mm -hmm. and then goes into you know, kind of references and what they mean, uh, you know, kind of just what we talked about, like what is Isaiah playing off of in, in some of these texts? What's he, you know, you you miss so much when you don't have like all, all the context. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> 
Yeah. And so it, it just, it, it makes the text so much deeper and richer to know that, yeah, it's, I mean, it, you can get a certain amount of meaning just reading it, you know, without the context, but right. If you know what the, the prophets are kind of railing against or, or referring to, it just becomes so much more, uh, meaningful and, and a deeper experience. So I, I definitely recommend that book, um, you know, you can find some articles by Peter Machinist, who's written about these sorts of things as well. Um, and then if I'm going to give a plug for anything, I guess I'll give a plug for Digital Hammurabi if you want to <laughs> go there and learn about uh, Mesopotamia and, you know, even the Hebrew Bible and that sort of stuff. Yeah. I think Definitely uh, check Josh them and out. Megan do <laughs> an incredible job. It's more, you know getting you know scholarship out there to people so yeah they do great work we love the democratization of scholarship love it mm -hmm. um, no it's it's fantastic and yeah what they're doing and what you're doing i think is so important it's you know getting these things out of you know the ivory tower getting them you know people to talk outside of their conferences and share this stuff it's 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 the only way this survives because academia is kind of in a nosedive so uh is it ever this, this is how it survives, I think. Yeah, I mean, I know we've, I, I think it was you, it was you or Josh that I was talking to, but just that academia is just sort of rotting from the inside out and people are sort of. It's not doing well yeah, now. Exiting in mass because of the way people, the way scholars are treated and just the terrible, just the, yeah, anyway, this isn't about that, but. Um, yeah, no, but. That. But yeah, I think that like what you're saying is dead on. That's why I appreciate Josh and Megan's work so much. Uh, people like Dan mm -hmm. McClellan, who are oh yeah, he's great. Like, I, yeah, he's. He, I just interviewed him not too long ago about um, the conceptions of deity in the Hebrew Bible, mm -hmm. and how we can use the lens of cognitive science to understand it better. And I feel like he just kind of knows everything somehow. Um, so like talking about evolution and the, uh, all these mm -hmm. experiments, um, and but. What again, what he does and what Josh and Megan are able to do is also put things in really understandable way um, and put it on, like in a video form so that folks can um, consume it in a way that's entertaining and easy for them, which really, if you're not a PhD candidate, is what people are trying to do, right? They're trying to get information in a way they mm -hmm. can understand it that takes 60 minutes or less. <laughs> So yeah, I guess that's a secondary plug. I, if you don't know who Dan McClellan is, uh, like, how have you been on my page for this long? Uh, but, but go check. I, him out. I second that recommendation. He's I've watched some of his videos. Super informative, super uh, great communicator, uh, getting ideas across in a simple, understandable way. Just, yeah, love everything I've I've seen from him. Also and I will say, as another plug, not to something that I like. Again, I have no connections to this, but if people want to read the royal and some of the royal inscriptions themselves, there. Um, if you Google um, RENAP, R I N A P, which is Royal Inscriptions of the Neo Assyrian Period, oh. um, you can find there's a, a site that's that's run where they've got. Uh, 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 I don't know if they're all of them, but they have a lot of them uh, up and, and free to, to read. Um, so I would suggest people check. I mean, you can buy the books like they're, you know, expensive, hardbound <laughs> books for like libraries and stuff. I don't own any because they're they're expensive, they're pretty expensive. <laughs> but um, it, but you can get it free online. And, cool. and there's there's an English translation. They have like the transliteration of the the Akkadian in one column, but then they'll have like the, the English in another. So people could just read along. It's fantastic. That's awesome. Yeah, I will have to check that out. Again, thank you so much for being here. For those of you watching, you know the drill. Like, subscribe, leave a comment, tell me what you think. Uh, but as always, thank you for watching and I will see you guys next time. Bye.